the Deputy Digital Editor at Black Enterprise, and this is The New Norm. On today's episode, which is sponsored by Cadillac, I have the privilege to speak with Dr. Marcus Collins, an award-winning marketer and cultural translator who serves as the Chief Strategy Officer at Wyden and Kennedy, New York, and as a marketing professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us again, my friend. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you for having me. This is an honor and a privilege. And I say it again because you killed it at the 2022 Entrepreneur Summit. You did a great TED Talk like session that let that wowed all of us. It was so good. That was awesome. Yo, the room was so lit. It was just such a great environment. I mean, all those entrepreneurs, they were super fired up. And I was grateful that I was able to give them something that was helpful for their business. But I guess more importantly, inspired them uh, to feel as though what they were setting out to achieve was all haveable. Oh, yeah. We definitely left with a lot of inspiration. And, you know, speaking of inspiration, you have a book. That's right. But before That's we right. go into it, Marcus, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey from an engineer to the chief strategy officer of a global advertising agency. And within all of that, I know you founded a music and tech startup. You've worked with yeah. Beyonce. You work with brands like iTunes and Nike. So if you can actually take us, give us the truncated version of that, that journey. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you the truncated version because it's definitely a long and windy road. I mean, essentially, I'm a product of Detroit, born and raised. Um, and at the time, you know, I, I did well in math and science as a kid. And if you were black, living in Detroit, did math and science, you were an engineer. So I went into engineering naturally at the University of Michigan, realized it wasn't the best thing for me, though it taught me a lot, particularly how to think. It wasn't what I felt fulfilled by. I really wanted to be a songwriter. So when I graduated from undergrad, I went to the music industry, doing some writing and producing, did a startup with 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 a, a colleague of mine that was doing it well until it wasn't because the music industry uh, was basically getting punched in the face by digital. So I went back to school to figure out this digital disruption that was happening in the world. Went back to school to my MBA, then went out west to go work at Apple, and then met Matthew Knowles. And you know he says, "Wait a minute, let me get this straight. You're an engineer. You started a music company. Uh, you have an MBA. You work at iTunes, and you're black, dude. You're not real. You're a unicorn. You don't exist." And I know I'm real. He says, well, you should run digital strategy for Beyonce. I say, oh, yeah, I should totally do that. Uh, and that's really sort of where I start to realize that what felt like disparate life experiences, engineering and music, and now marketing start to kind of come, come together. Um, worked with her during her launch of I Am Sasha Fierce. So I got a chance to be a part of like seeing Beyonce go from like Beyonce to like Queen B, which is really awesome. And, and even got a chance to see the early starts of what ended up becoming the Beehive. <laughs> And I found myself leaning more into advertising. So I went to a pure play agency, advertising agency, then went to go work with Steve Stout at Translation, which is really where I had like the biggest inflection point in my career, where I started to realize understanding human behavior and applying it to what we do as practitioners was sort of the biggest cheat code ever. And from there, I just continued to invest myself in the world of advertising and really ingratiate myself into the world of academia. Went and got a PhD while also practicing and realized that the bridging of the academic practitioner gap is really the sweet spot for me. So I think about what I, what I do as a practitioner and as an academic is to understand why people do what they do. And how do we put things in the world to influence people to take action? Amazing. Okay. I don't even know how you got that out on all one breath, but that is so <laughs> much there. And, you know, like you said, you study and specialize in human behavior. Um, as a practitioner in academia. And I feel like it all comes together in your new book for the culture, the power behind what we buy, what we do, and who we want to be. Uh, this book, when and why did you decide to write it? So I realized while I was studying behavioral sciences and working at translation specifically, I realized that there is no force more influential on human behavior than culture, full stop. Like nothing more influential than, than culture. And I thought to myself, well, if, as a marketer, our job is to influence behavior, to get people to do things, to buy, to download, to subscribe, to watch, to share, uh, to, to, to go to the website. It's like then understanding why people do what they do and how to influence them is part and parcel to the gig. So understanding culture 
would only be sort of the battery in my back. And then as I started to broaden the aperture, it's like, oh, whether you're a marketer or a politician or an activist or a clergy or a leader or a manager, we're all trying to influence behavior. So we all can benefit from understanding the underlying physics of human behavior, which is culture. And I realized this, which may seem like a no duh to many people because it's, it's sort of intuitive. But what I found interesting is that when you ask people to describe and define culture, you get a lot of Homer Simpson blank stares. Like we just don't have the right language to describe it because it's so abstract, it's so nebulous, and it's all around us. It's like explaining water to a fish. It's in everything that we do. So I realized that, hey, we need some, we need a Rosetta Stone to talk about culture, we need language to talk about it. And then we also need to operationalize it. So now that we know how to talk about it concretely, how do we use it? And the book is really centered on that argument, that culture influences people in a more predictable way than anything else known to man. And if we leverage culture, then we can influence people's behavior to a predictable, a predictable clip. However, we have to understand what it is. So the book kind of goes from know why, why culture has this influence on us, to know how. How do we leverage it to get people to buy, get people to vote, get people to subscribe, get people to join the movement, get people to join your church, get people to uh, get my kid to eat her peas? Like everything we're doing is to influence behavior and understanding culture becomes the, the, the biggest cheat code we have to do that. So in the book, you start off and I told you I'm still reading it, but I love the way you started. You took a deep dive into the 1960s and just the, the hipster, the hippie culture that that yeah. change um you know so much about our world and, and how we interact it whatever music everything um and then you correlate that with hipster culture modern right. day right. right and then also how brands companies some were very successful in in really tapping in to these subcultures which became mainstream um That's right talk about again just the, I, I think that that dynamic, right? When you say culture, uh, it influences everything we do, the way we think, the way we talk, the way we dress, and of course, what we buy. Why is that yeah. so important? So we start with defining culture. And I look at culture through a Durkheimian lens. Emil Durkheim is one of the founding fathers of sociology. And interestingly, these cats... Uh, the founding fathers of sociology is Marx, Durkheim, Weber. They all studied religion to observe culture, right? Like we have a religious relationship with culture. So I, I look at culture through the lens of Durkheim and he describes culture as a system of values, beliefs, norms, and symbols, right? It's a system. And if you look at like the later literature in 1950s, 1960s, you got Raymond Williams, who looked at it as a system of systems. And I like to think about it that way. It's a system of systems. Culture starts with our identity. How do I self-identify? Right? Let's say I'm a Christian, right? I, I'm, I'm a Christian. So because of my identity, I have a certain set of beliefs and ideologies. That is, I have certain truths that I hold of the world, and I have ideology, stories I tell myself about the world because of those truths. So I'm a Christian. I believe Jesus Christ died for our sins. That's what I believe, right? And because I hold that belief, I show up in the world a certain way. I wear certain clothes, certain artifacts. I behave a certain way, right? Certain norms, sort of traditions, certain rituals. And I speak a certain way. And I reflect all of those beliefs, ideologies, and way of life. I reflect them through the cultural product that I consume. The music I listen to, the movies I watch, the shows I watch, the literature I consume, uh, uh, the comic books I read, if you're a comic book person, but also the brands and branded products that I buy. And it goes to this very simple idea that consumption, by its very nature, is a cultural act. What we buy, where we go, what we do, how we adorn ourselves, the car we drive, the phone we use, the, the people we marry, if we marry, where we go to school, if we decide to go to school, how we bury the dead. All these things are byproducts of our cultural subscription, right? We do because we are. And culture moves forward on the basis of one simple question. Do people like me do something like this? The answer is yes, I do it. The answer is no, I don't. It informs everything. So if you are a marketer trying to get people to buy your widget, understanding people's cultural subscription is the foundation to getting them to move. If you're a politician, right, 
you activate people through their cultural subscription, right? If you are a publisher, right, there is a curatorial lens that Black Enterprise has that sees the world a certain way, right? And therefore, we activate people based on a shared cultural frame. And for me, I realize that the better we understand this, the more predictable the outcomes become. And we are Superman predictable. So you can look at this from a religious standpoint. You can look at it from a, a movement like the beatniks, which turned into hippies, which turned into hipsters, mm -hmm. right? You can look at it from, from hip hop. You can look at it from almost every single angle right. because as tribal species, that is mankind, we're social animals by nature, we find ourselves in these groups of people that are governed by subcultures, by cultural characteristics. Mm -hmm. And the better we understand that, the more likely we are to get people to move. You know, I, I love how you say that and how you put that. We're all byproducts of our cultural subscriptions, right? And if you understand and, and see how important culture is, how is it that brands and companies are still missing the mark? Like, I mean, what you say just makes so much sense. And it's like, duh, like, yeah, one plus one equals two. Where's yeah. that disconnect coming in? Because the obvious isn't obvious if someone points it out to you. And truly, the idea is that <clears throat> we have so much information at our disposal that we think that because we have consumer data that we know people. But the challenge is that we actually confuse information for intimacy, right? We think that information only that know who you are, but those two things are analogous. You think of any meaning you have, you may check on LinkedIn right quick to see who that person is before you meet them, but you don't know them until you talk to them. You don't know them until you engage with them. And brands, organizations, entities, institutions, celebrities, mm -hmm. public figures, they miss the mark, not because of intentionality. They miss the mark because they don't have intimacy. They don't see the world through people's lenses. And we see the world not the way it is, but the way that we are, mm. the way that we frame the world and what informs that frame, culture. And if I don't understand the beliefs that you hold, if I don't understand that artifacts have meaning, if I don't understand the language that you use or things that are normative, then I totally miss the mark, right? Like I, I remember um, I was telling my class this once, you know, my, one of my favorite lyrics uh, from, from Snoop is from Drop Like It's Hot. It says, keep a blue flag hanging on my backside, only on my left side. Yeah, that's the crip side. Now, if you don't know that blue is a, a substitute for crip, you go, that guy is super color coordinated. <laughs> like, we, we don't understand what it means. Right. Right? If you don't have the cultural intimacy, you don't know that meaning. And like the entire country, at least a third of the country, watch Snoop Dogg Crip set. You know, he, 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 he set trip, rather, he set trip while he was Crip walking during the Super Bowl. And my mother was like, yo, he, he dances so well. And I'm like, mom, he is set tripping right now. But she doesn't know that because she doesn't understand the cultural meaning. And this is where brands get it wrong all the time. Not because they are, uh, not because they're 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 malicious, or not because they are um, th that they're they're ill and they have ill intent. It's that they are just ill informed because they don't right. have intimacy, and they're not understanding the cultural context. Um, how do right. brands, how do companies begin to cultivate an intimate relationship with their audience? Yeah, you know, I I'd say take from the comedians. Comedians are the best market researchers on the planet because they just watch people. They observe people in their cultural contexts, right? They just watch people and they go, oh, that was weird. See what she did? And he did it too. And she did it too. Okay, this is a thing. And then they kind of step back and say, why is this happening? They apply theory to what they observe. And once they figure out the right theory that captures what they observe, they find a way to say it with a hook, right? Or, or as a uh, um, Emily Dickens say it, you know, they tell all the truth, but tell it slant. They find the slant for it. Then they get on stage and say, hey, you ever notice that every time you go to the mall, you do X, Y, and Z? We go, that's so me. I totally do that. Of course it is because they have intimacy. So as marketers, we should be observing people in their cultural context to get that kind of intimacy. We observe and say, why is that happening? Then we apply theory to it. And as we apply theory to it, we can say, okay, here's the opportunity for, for us as a brand to contribute to the cultural practices. And there are tons of there, there, there are tons of methodologies that we can leverage from academia to do that. Ethnographic work, netnographic work, which are online ethnographies, or anthropological work. And for me, this is like 
this is like the con this is the, the convergence of my worlds, the academic world and the practicing world. I leverage what I know of academia, what we rigorously interrogate uh, about human behavior in, in our scholarship. And I take it to what it means to actually put things in the world from a business reality and bring those two things together, help us unlock the things that seem obvious once it's pointed out to you, but if no one points it out, you totally missed the mark. Marcus, you know, I love everything you're saying. And one thing that I love the most is the fact that it translates to almost anyone. Like you, you talk right. about this in the book, um, we all have influence and we're all trying to use our influence um, right. in, in some type of way that's effective, whether you're a teacher, an engineer, uh, you know, right. a, a business leader, an entrepreneur, whatever it is, we need to understand um, human behavior. We need to understand culture in order to be effective in our own professions and careers. Talk about how, how this philosophy, how these theories translate to the everyday person. Yo, I mean, you, you said it perfectly. To, I mean, of course you would because you're Selena, you do everything great, right? But, but, but like you said it, nailed it. It's the, 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 the idea here is that this isn't a marketing book. It's a people book. It's a human being book. And the better that we understand the way people see the world, the better citizens we become. Right. It's like, you know, we can look at something and say, man, those people are crazy. That's a very easy thing to do. Very easy thing to do. But once we remove our sort of biases and see the world through their lenses, we go, I may not agree with it, but I understand. Mm -hmm. And get us to understanding gets us to empathy. And that creates a far more civil way of life. Right. Imagine if marketers talk to you like a human being. I describe it as like yelling upstairs. Marketers just yell upstairs. <laughs> hey. Bring my glasses down, Georgia. Me tell my, my daughter that. Right? I yell at her. She doesn't do anything. I just yell at her. And she just kind of keeps running upstairs. And so I go upstairs and say, hey, Georgia, could you get my glasses? She says, sure, totally. Thank you. Once I engage her like a human, when marketers do that, we see far better uh, results in commerce. When we engage each other as humans, right? we find equal footing. When our managers engage us like humans, we feel like we belong at a place. Right? When we're in an organization and we feel like people understand us, you get more out of me. Right? Essentially, we're trying to extract as much value as we can from everything that we do, from the time that we spend, from the people that we spend time with, from the things that we do, the things that we put in the world. And what was required for that to happen is that people take action in everything. I want to be mayor. How do I become mayor? I got to get people to vote. How do I get people to vote? If I just you know talk junk about the guy next to me, People go, okay, you know, I don't even know who you are. I don't feel connected to you. When people feel connected. They're more inclined to move. Well, what makes us feel connected? Commonality. The literature refers to this as, as homophily, right? Homophily, that is self-loving, right? And we like people who are like ourselves. You know, you bump into someone and you go, oh, where are you from? I'm from Detroit. Oh my God, so am I. Oh my goodness. Where'd you go to school? I went to Cass. So did I. Oh my God, best friends. Like, this is what we do. We like people who are like us. And that is we find commonality because if you come from where I come from or went where I went, then you probably see the world the way I do and I can trust you. And this idea of leveraging culture as a way to influence behavior is really a way of saying this is about connecting to people based on their identity and the shared way in which they see the world. And it's from that that we're able to ingratiate ourselves and foster trust. And this is why people have to go out and get the book. Whether you are a teacher or a small business owner, as Marcus just uh, profoundly explained, people trust who they like. And in order to be liked, in order to be trusted, you need to find connection. And the best way to find connection mm -hmm. is through understanding and empathy. And if you mm -hmm. look at it through a marketing lens, I mean, the answer is here. I, I love this. One thing I was surprised about, Marcus, was this is your first book. I'm just like, how yeah. many of you doing my research? I'm like, how many other books has he has he written? You have such a way with words. Um, and people just gravitate to you, whether you're doing you know, speech or in the classroom, et cetera. So I'm just like, this is your first book? Why now it's, and why this? So it is the first one. First, thank you. That that, that that's a blessing. Um I, I've, I've contributed to anthology, so I've written chapters before, but never my first book. And a part of it, I think, honestly, I, I, I it's probably a bit of imposter syndrome that it's like, oh, man, like you're both. If, if I do it with other people, I can sort of hide in the cut. You know, I could just sort of, you know, be in the corner and like it was a collective effort. Right. 
But when it's yours, it's yours. Like you know, your first solo album, it's you. It's all, it's all on you. <clears throat> I think a part of me sort of wrestled with the idea that did I have something to say that could be helpful? And I think you know the the the, the north star for everything I do is is to be a servant to help people realize the best version of themselves. And I just so happen to teach and you know uh, uh, work with clients and, and teams and, and and get on stages and give talks to help people be the best version of themselves. And I think I kind of questioned if I had enough to give in, in a book. And what I realized during COVID is that we found ourselves doing everything we can to connect, every single thing that we could to connect. I mean, months before COVID happened, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was on the Senate floor defending Facebook and all the privacy, privacy concerns that we were having. COVID happens, no one says a peep about privacy, not one iota of argument or discourse about privacy. We were doing everything we can to connect. And I realized that, oh man, this is really what, what life is all about, connecting with each other, finding ways to connect. And I thought to myself, like, I think I have something to say about that. And I've been talking about it from through a marketing lens because that's I'm a marketer. But to your earlier point, my contribution to the discourse is just far greater. And it took, it took me understanding that to say, okay, I can do this. And even then, even then I had a little reluctancy but uh, I had a, a close friend of mine pass right at the top of COVID. His name is uh, Marlo Stoudemire. He was a man of among He's a giant. He's like the guy in Detroit. He's the guy, like the mayor of Detroit, practically. Um, really young, like 40, 41, 42 years old. And he died like March 24th of 2020. And I realized in that moment, just, it's just such a sobering moment for me because this guy had his whole life in front of him. Family, you know, two kids and, and, and wife. His business was doing so well. And it's realized just how finite and how precious life is. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, it would be, it would be, it would be irresponsible for me not to share what's inside of me. And I read a book called um, Die Empty. And that just underscored everything for me. And that book talks about the notion that the most expensive real estate in the world is the graveyard. Because it's the graveyard where books weren't written, companies weren't launched, albums weren't recorded, comp uh, uh, stories weren't told. Like we, we, we always wait for like the right moment to do a thing. I wait for the right moment to start my company. Wait for the right moment to, 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 you know, to record this album. Wait for the right moment. But it's never the right moment. And after Marlo's passing, I told myself I'm going to die empty. So everything that I have in me, I'm going to give it out. And that was the perfect battery that I needed to, uh, to, to, to write the book. That is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that story. It's so funny because I'm glad you you referenced that that saying, that quote, because my pastor used to say it all the time. And I was just like, oh, my pastor is brilliant. He made that up. <laughs> I was like, that's where he got it from. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, no, that that was great. Um, and again, so many gems and nuggets shared here. It, it's almost um surprising to hear you say you suffer from imposter syndrome like so many people do and we know that studies show that yeah. minorities people of color and women um suffer from imposter syndrome the most even you Absolutely. you know with a doctor degree you know someone who's literally helped beyonce build her brand um can you tell us about a little bit more how you've been working through that because i think that that relates to a lot of us especially those who are successful yeah, I think it requires self-talk. Like, talk, we had to talk to ourselves better. That's actually my New Year's resolution uh, last year was talk to myself better. And I didn't, I didn't realize it until I realized it. I found myself saying, "Oh, stupid! Oh, that was dumb." It's like, why are you, why are you, why are you saying it to yourself? Like, if anyone talked to me like that, I'd punch them in the face, right? But I was, I was like the worst, not just the worst critic. I was just the the worst advocate for for myself. And as I started talking to myself better. I started to realize that there are moments I find myself in that I talk myself out of it. And I go, oh man, are you ready for this? Maybe you shouldn't be this, or maybe you're not ready. And I go, fam, if you're not gonna fire yourself up, if you're not gonna hype yourself up, how can you expect anybody else to? Right? If you're not gonna believe in you, no one else is gonna believe in you. So I think that what it starts is first sort of grounding yourself to say, I'm going to be better to myself. I'm gonna to talk to myself better. And what we know of the psychology is that, look, the, the the brain is hard, as a hardware that drive that, that that that's driven by software, and we train our software based on what we tell ourselves. 
right? We are telling ourselves, telling our brain, hey, here's the world. And then this is how you show up in it. So if we start by telling ourselves better stories, at the very least, it starts to, to mitigate some of that negative talk. And you start to say, not necessarily I belong here, but start to say, okay, I should be here. And that may seem like hair splitting. Belong here feels like I earned this. Mm. But when you start saying I should be here, it's like I've been placed here. Like even as you said, like you know, your, your, your pastor gives you words that you can kind of take with you mm -hmm. and rehearse to yourself as you go out in, in, in the world. And like what our pastor always talks about is that like everything is a given to you. you. You didn't earn it. This is grace and mercy that was given to you. And if it's given to you, then it's irresponsible for you not to cherish the gift. If you gave me a Christmas gift and I was like, oh, I don't deserve this. Thanks so much. Thing. I don't deserve this. I'm going to put this on the shelf and never play with it. I don't deserve it. Then you'd be like, fam, you are disrespecting me. But when we take a gift and say, oh, this was given to me. This belongs to me. I need to treat it as such. So I treat the rooms that I'm in with a lot of respect because I know that it, it was given to me. It's a gift. Not that I earned it, but it was given to me, right? And look, and who am I to tell God what he should be given? Right? So I got to question that. So, so the way I sort of unpack or at least mitigate um, the imposter syndrome, I tell myself that it's, like, it's not about me. That like, if God has given it to me, then it's for me. And now if I don't feel like I'm there, I need to work to get myself there, right? But it belongs to me. It's mine, right? And it's just, just being a better friend to yourself. Just talk to yourself better. And it seems so small and so trivial, but the, the biology tells us, the biology and the psychology tells us that its impact is significant. It is. And, and to the point that you made, if you didn't share what you shared in this book, I would be upset. I'm like, you have all, of, you did all this research, all this experience. Yeah, share it with the world. And don't question and doubt yourself because it is so helpful and so powerful. Um, you know, lastly, Marcus, before we let you go, there's one thing I wanted to talk to you about because you are an expert okay, in sure. culture. And this is a cultural phenomenon, Twitter, right? It yeah. revolutionized the way people connected and communicated. And as of late, it's faced a number of challenges. And now it's under heavy scrutiny following the takeover of Elon Musk. Do you yeah. think a brand like this could be restored to its former days of glory and power? And if so, like, how would you counsel that brand, this company? So the, the, the thing that's, in, that's working in Twitter's favor is that people are not conflating the brand Twitter with the brand Elon Musk. They're doing a really good job of bifurcating those two things. <clears throat> so that actually bodes really well for Twitter, that whenever prayerfully, inshallah, that Elon Musk moves out of the picture, Twitter can say, okay, cool, that, that bad element is gone. Now we're rocking with you. Like it's back to where, where it should be. <clears throat> so there's a lot of, there's a lot of redeeming, redeeming, um, uh, 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 redeeming qualities there le left for Twitter. But the more that Twitter becomes merged with Elon Musk, the harder it will be to, to make that, that separation. I think about it a lot. Like, uh, like when the inverse is when Steve Jobs left Apple, when he was there, Apple was like, Apple, Apple, <laughs> he left John Scully comes in runs the place and just takes the place, right? Steve Jobs comes back and he brings it, restores it back to where it was because Steve Jobs and Apple were semiotic. They saw the world similar. They were of the same cultural ilk. Elon Musk and what Twitter as a brand stands for and the meaning that we have associated in our minds, those two things are not analogous. And that's why we're seeing so much, uh, uh, so much conflict because of incongruence. But once Elon Musk decides to prayerfully, decides to step aside, it will allow us to make those two separations very, very clearly. And, you know, we need a Twitter. I mean, I would argue and say that Twitter is not just a social networking platform. It's a public utility, right? It, it, it allows us to, 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 to spread information quickly in places where there is opacity. When you think about third world countries that were able to understand well, the civil unrest that was happening there so that it could become a global uh, uh, issue, not just this local issue because of, of Twitter. I mean, you think about 2020 with George Floyd, all the civil unrest that we're experiencing, those things are being propagated because of Twitter. Like We need that in an effort to help us communicate the cultural product that is the world in which we live in. I agree. Elon tweeted that 
he will resign. Um, preferably, like you said, if he finds someone foolish enough to take the job of CEO, who do you foresee right. is someone that would be, I guess, a good brand representative of Twitter and could take the company to the next level? You know, a part of me feels like there needs to be some separation between church and state between Elon and Twitter. So he is, you know, the, the owner of it. You know, he needs to sort of really step away, not have someone who's under his tutelage is kind of doing his work sort of like, like he, we don't need anyone that would be geppettoed by Elon Musk, right? We don't need a, a puppet. We need someone who's going to lead this thing. And a part of me always feel like, man, maybe Jack Dorsey needs to come back, right? Or Evan Williams, like those, the, 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 the early founders need to come back and sort of restore itself. Um, I think that there's been some distrust with Jack Dorsey, honestly. Um, but I think he has enough goodwill that might be able to bring this thing back to, to where it needs to be. I agree. I was thinking Jack Dorsey as well. Uh, Marcus, again, we are so grateful for your time today for the book. Please let us know, again, the name of your book and when and how we can all pick it up. It's called For the Culture. It is available um, on May 2nd. It hits bookstores, but you can pre-order right now where all books are sold. Uh, you can find me on the social webs at Mark to the C, M-A-R-C-T-O-T-H-E-C, um, where, where I'm telling more about the book, explaining more about the book, but also giving tools to leverage what's in the book. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Ms. Lena, thank you so much for having me here. This is always a pleasure to spend time with you, my friend. Um, is there anything else you want to add or talk about? Anything else? I mean, you did such a good job. You even read the book fully. <laughs> you're, so, you're totally hit, hitting on it. I, I will say one thing. <clears throat> I will say one thing. There is one thing that I think is important um, about the book is that you know, we, we talk about what culture is and why it has an effect on us and then explain how we use it. But it's important to know that I, I end the book talking about the ethical implications of all this. Because we talk about how do we influence behavior, there then becomes responsibility to what are we influencing people to do. And the more that we know, the more responsibility we have to do things that are in the best interest of, of, of society. Because the same that it, when we talk about culture, like it's, it is not, it doesn't have value to it. It's not good or bad. It just, just is that it has this influence on us. And the same ways that people leverage culture to get people to join a movement to to increase uh, voter rights. They're the same levers that people pull to get people to join ISIS. It's the exact same thing. The same levers are at play. So as you read the book, and, and, I, and I push this uh, with, with, great, with great urgency, that we have to do it from a place of helping people, of contributing to, to society. This requires us being understanding about cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation, right? That we're contributing, not taking. We are, we are uh, adding to the discourse, not extracting what works for us. So it's really important that as we talk about all this great stuff about influence and behavior, that we also have the ethical conversation as a part of the discourse as well. Yeah. When you said that, my mind automatically went to, to Hitler and the Nazis and, and white right. supremacy and MAGA, right. <laughs> I mean, in my opinion. Right. But um, yeah, no, it, it's just to your point, like it sounds like what you're saying, there's these leaders, you know, they have a deep understanding of culture, the trends, um, the needs of the people, and they're able to tap into that vulnerability and then use that, maybe even manipulate it to a greater evil. Um, is there any way to MAGA was great at that. MAGA was perfect at that. They identified the cultural characteristics of a group of people that were being ignored and they preached the gospel. And then they said, yeah, I rock with that guy. That guy sees the world the way I do. That's my guy. And they buy the gear, they go evangelize, they go storm the Capitol. You know, like, like these people took massive efforts to demonstrate their connection to an ideology, to a belief, to an institution. Mm -hmm. Right. And if those things can be done for horrible things like that, Imagine what could be done for greater representation of people of color, of women's rights, of reducing voter suppression, of mitigating Asian hate, all these things that we want to see wrongs we want to see right in the world. Leveraging culture helps us do that to a really, really powerful uh, uh, fidelity. It does. 
Thank you again, Marcus. Appreciate you again uh, for your time. And we will definitely see you again here on Black Enterprise. Thank you, my friend. Take care.